once again we're looking at the red trail of the lord jesus christ and you guys left me some great uh, comments and ideas about this and i was thinking it'd probably be even better if you guys just sent it to my email <clears throat> hensley bible believer at gmail.com that way uh what you say doesn't get lost in the comments <clears throat> but i want to uh give some of the ones that were left in the comments you know i told you you know if you find jesus in some of these verses and i don't point it out just uh send me a comment and i'll point it out next time and my friend jason pointed out this one in genesis 2 10 where it says and a river went out of eden to water the garden and from thence it was parted and became into four heads well what's jesus in john 4 10 through 11 he gives that living water you know water uh, the first time it shows up it's bringing life and that's what jesus does he's the, the living water. In John seven thirty eight, he says he's that he's the living water. And then uh, this is a, going into a garden, right? And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, uh, it says, Paul says, I have planted and Apollos watered and God, but God gave the increase. You know, when you're, when we go soul winning, it's like planting and watering. And when you, we got someone through the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ gives them life. And he is that living water. So that's a really good one. And then. Mandy pointed out one. Another one. In Genesis 3.21. It says unto Adam also. And to his wife. Did the Lord God make coats of skins. And clothed them now that's uh, i'm surprised i missed this one clothed them this is really good you know when you got saved the lord clothes you in ephesians 6 11 he gives you the whole armor of god and uh, psalm 85 2 and romans 4 7 it talks about your sins being covered in romans 4 7 it says blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute sin. And then in Revelation 19.8, it says, Fine linen is the righteousness of saints. When you get saved, you get a brand new wardrobe. Uh, you get clothed. He, he's going to clothe you with righteousness. And then um, at the redemption of your body, you get clothed in a new body. So he made coats of skins and clothed them. You get a whole new wardrobe at salvation. And that's what this pictures. So those are some really good ones. And then uh, someone else pointed this one out. It, it says in Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And, you know, they pointed out this is the first time you see the word sweat. The word sweat occurs three times in the Bible. Sweat is part of the curse. He told Adam, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. And he pointed out how Aaron and his sons had to wear linen breeches and linen bonnets as they went into the tabernacle so that they wouldn't sweat. They had to wear clothes that wouldn't cause them to sweat in Exodus 28, 40 through 43 because it's part of that the curse. And Ezekiel 44, 18, look at, look at that verse showing you that they wear this but so that they won't sweat. And that's significant because the third mention of sweat is Jesus sweating as it were great drops of blood in Luke twenty two forty four. What does his blood do? Cleanses us from sin. It takes care of that curse. Jesus had to come down uh, in the fashion of a man and do all the things that we do. Go all the, go through all the things that we go through and do it without sin. And he had to come down and sweat. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood. And his blood cleanses us from sin, takes care of the curse. That's a great one right there. And now, moving on to chapter 4. What we got in chapter 4 is, Cain, a tiller of the ground, pictures the Antichrist and men of the world, because you know he's a tiller of the ground, 
Abel, a shepherd, pictures Jesus Christ and the righteous. Cain killing Abel is an attack on the seed. And we know Jesus is the promised seed. But the devil moving Cain to kill Abel is just another attack on the seed. So, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. That pictures Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a keeper of the sheep. In Jude 1, 24, he sa it says, Who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his joy, before the presence of his joy with exceeding, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Revelation 3, 10, he keeps them from the hour of temptation. Jesus is the keeper of sheep because he's the shepherd. It calls him the good shepherd, John 10, 11. He's the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5, 4. Abel was a shepherd, a keeper of sheep. Jesus Christ is a shepherd, a keeper of sheep. So that's, this is some just amazing pictures here. Abel pictures Jesus. And verse 4, and Abel, he also brought the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. The Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering, just as he had respect unto the Lord Jesus Christ offering. Hebrews 9.28, he offered himself. He brought of the first things of his flock. Well, what's Jesus Christ? He's the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Anytime somebody brings a bloody animal sacrifice, that's just a picture of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect, the ultimate sacrifice which permanently takes away sin. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin but Jesus Christ is a lamb without blemish and without spot. His blood takes away sin. Now Cain, and Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So Cain is upset that God didn't accept his offering, and he accepted Abel's offering, so he's moved by envy to kill Abel. And Cain pictures the Jews killing Jesus. That's what this pictures. And you know why they did it? Because of envy. In Mark 15, 9 through 10, Jesus was also killed because of envy. And then you got over here, and he said, What hast thou done? The Lord said this to Cain, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Uh, just like he shed Abel's blood, the Jews shed the Lord Jesus Christ's blood. And Hebrews 12, 24 says it speaks better things than that of Abel. And Adam knew his wife, so Cain kills Abel. The devil thinks, well, I've got this thing fixed. I've got it defeated. And it says in verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said she hath appointed me another seed, another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So Abel and his death picture the first coming. When Jesus Christ came the first time, he died, but he rose again. Satan thought he killed the seed, right? He thought, well, I've killed Abel. Uh, that was my greatest attack on the seed. I don't have to worry about it anymore. But then what happens? In verse 25, Seth is born. God gives him another seed. And so Seth pictures the second coming. Just when you thought the hero was dead, here comes Jesus Christ back at the second coming. So Seth pictures the second coming, and he preserves the seed. Abel's dead. That's okay. Here comes Seth. He's going to preserve the seed. And this is a picture of how the second birth is better than the first birth when you get were born the first time that birth was no good if that's the only birth you got you're going to die and go to hell but if you've been born again that's what gets you in so that's just amazing pictures right there then we got chapter five chapter five is about the generations of adam you think it's just a bunch of names you thought wrong. I love this chapter and how it talks about like the long lifespans before the flood. And the first verse says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, the next time that the Bible says the book of the generations, 
it talks about somebody else. So in the book of the generations of Adam, and here in Genesis 5, everybody dies, right? That's where it says, so-and-so lived to be this long, and he died. So-and-so lived to be this long, and he died. But in Matthew 1, 1, you got the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, and it doesn't mention death. You see, Jesus is the last Adam. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it talks about the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. That means he makes alive. Adam brought death. Jesus Christ is a quickening spirit. He brought life. And in the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, nobody dies. It doesn't mention their death. In Adam, all die. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. But in Jesus Christ, you're made alive. Now, Methuselah. Methuselah, the oldest man, and all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Methuselah, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records, if they had one, for the oldest man who ever lived. But watch Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7, 9. What did he say about himself to the Pharisees? He said, before Abraham was, I am. What did he say in Revelation? He said, I am the beginning and the ending. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Methuselah, the oldest man, but he's outshined by the Lord Jesus Christ, the Ancient of Days. And something else, Noah is born, and he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning the work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Noah's name means rest. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, the Lord said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Something, this may be a stretch, but when I was reading this, this just, it's just what it reminded me of. Maybe it's a stretch, maybe not. I don't think it's wrong for something to remind you of something. So you don't have to take this one on if you don't want to. But what I noticed was it talks about Methuselah's death, right? Now, I know Methuselah doesn't die until right before the flood because, you know, his name means when he's dead, it shall come, or when he's dead, it shall be sent, referring to the flood. But here you, you do have... Uh, Methuselah's death mentioned before Noah's born, even though he doesn't die when Noah's born. So you, and you, you have the word comfort mentioned. So it mentions Methuselah's death, right? And then it mentions Noah and comfort. Well, what did Jesus, if, if Methuselah pictures Jesus after Methuselah's death, you got the word comfort. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. You know, he said, if I go away, I'll not leave you comfortless. He sends the Holy Spirit after he goes on. And Noah brings comfort. And what does Noah do? He, released, he releases a dove out of the ark, right? A dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit. So I, th I thought that was interesting. Maybe it's a stretch, maybe not. Yeah, maybe you like it. Then you got in chapter 6. This is a, a significant chapter because in chapter 6, the sons of God taking daughters of men was just another attack on the seed. It was just another attack on the seed, just like Cain killing Abel. You see, Satan wanted to corrupt the gene pool. He thought if he could corrupt the gene pool, he could eliminate the seed. But Noah was perfect in his generations, perfect in his generations. You know, Satan uh, got these sons of God to mix with the daughters of men. He thought, he, well, I've got the gene pool corrupted. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. So Noah is going to carry on the seed. That's who God wants in that ark so that he can carry on the seed. And I just think that's amazing right there. And, of course, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, just like me and you. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So grace, you find it all the way through the scriptures. And... But then we get into something else. The ark itself is 
and a, a picture of the Lord Jesus. Verse 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. The judgment touches the ark. When that flood comes, it doesn't touch Noah and his family. It touches the ark, not the ones inside. Just as Jesus took the judgment of sin on the cross so that it wouldn't touch those in Christ. So Jesus is our ark. The ark is a picture of the Lord Jesus. Uh, the fact that it's made of gopher wood is significant. He, the Lord said to Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Gopher wood, the material used to build the ark, was living organisms that died to save Noah. So this picture is Jesus manifesting himself in the flesh to die for us. That's, a, that's an amazing picture right there. Notice the next thing here. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. God laid out the fashion of the ark just as he does the plan of salvation. None of us have a right to come up with our own way of salvation. None of us came up with the, with the perfect plan of salvation. God had to give it to us. Another thing. A window shalt thou make to the ark. And in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories, shalt thou make it. So Jesus was pierced in the side, right? Well, that's where the door was. Guess what? He is the door. The Roman soldier pierced him in his side in John 19, 34. Jesus said, I am the door. In John 10, 7 through 9, in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So he's the door in John 10. That's the only door into heaven because he's the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to get in the ark was through that one door that was in the side of the ark. Jesus was pierced in his side. That's significant. That's crazy. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door, only one door of the ark, shalt thou set in the side. Jesus was pierced in his side. So it's got a window, and it's above. So you know what? That window, Noah had to stay looking up. He couldn't look down. If he wanted to see out, he had to look up. And if we want to see out of this mess that we're in, we look up. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, it talks about set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. God's plan for the ark was in mind long before the flood, right? You know, he had Noah building and preaching for 120 years, just as the death of Jesus Christ was in mind long before before it took place he had it planned he had it planned for you know he he uh, saw that adam and eve was going to sin but before they even sinned he already had a plan to save them so that's significant and i'll go ahead and stop there and you guys just uh give me your suggestions point out some things i missed uh, try to send it to that email if you can. That way I, I hope I don't look over it and miss it. And if I don't respond to it or uh, point it out in a video, just send it again. Because sometimes my emails get lost and stuff like that. But that was chapter 4 through 6 there. And I hope it gets you interested in the Bible, gets you excited about reading it. Just read through chapters 4 through 6 and then... 7 through 9 and uh, find some things and point them out to me just like I'm pointing these out to you.